Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our town hall meeting, the town hall meeting held by the Monset Port Development Project. Before we go any further, we'll pause for a word of prayer by the director of the Monset National Trust, Mrs. Sarita Weeks Francis. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for life and for strength and for wisdom and understanding. We thank you, Lord, for your beauty of your creation. We thank you that you have given men wisdom to design and to build a port in Montserrat. We thank you for all your benefits. We thank you for your protection. We thank you for this meeting that is being held to inform and to enlighten and to share. And we pray your blessings on this evening's proceedings. We ask this in your name and in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. And for me, she's Teacher Sarita. So. Welcome to all of us, Mon Sessions, whether you're at home or abroad, whether you're here in the auditorium or joining us online. We are all here because I'm sure you want to hear what has been happening during this phase of the Port Development Project. Since the contract was signed in May, 2022, there has been work going on. I know a lot of us haven't seen the jetty itself, but there has been work. So today we're here to update you on what has been happening as we move this project from the drawing board, the desktop, to the water top. At our first town hall meeting, March 2nd, 2023, some questions were asked that we needed to go and do so our homework. And we are back and we will be sharing with you. And also, you'll have an opportunity too to ask questions and hopefully we can have a vibrant discussion, a discussion that will lead to us having a port that is workable for if not all of us, most of us. Now this port development project, the Monset Port Development Project, is sponsored, co-sponsored by the Caribbean Development Bank, the United Kingdom Caribbean Infrastructure Fund, and the European Union. And as I mentioned before, we're in the implementation stage of the project. There are three agencies or entities overseeing the implementation. We have the client side, and the client refers to the part of the government of Monster that represents each and every one of us. It falls under the Ministry of Communication, Works, Labor, and Energy, and we have the Monster Port Development Project Team, and that team is currently being led by Mr. Walston Patterson. Then we have the supervising engineers, the ones who are checking to make sure on behalf of the government that things are going smoothly and they're liaising with the contractor. So the supervising engineers are Stantec and the resident engineer representing Stantec is Mr. Robert Bodash, Mr. Bodash. And then the contractor who will be doing most of the work for us so we can see a jetty is the Meridian Construction Company Limited. And today, they're represented here by the project manager, Mr. Peter Watanoffer. 
So thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. And we don't want to waste much time, so now we're going to start with the update. We're going to be doing updates, answering questions that you, our participants, our fellow Monsessions asked at the March 2nd meeting. It's always a pleasure for us to, to be able to come and engage our community with our community project, the Montserrat Port Development Project. And it's a pleasure of mine to be here to just to share a bit of what is happening. Uh, but I want to zero in on some of the questions that we had previously asked at our town hall meeting. And also, we, we have been doing some engagement through focus groups as well. And so I'm going to touch at least on one, one of those questions. I won't, I won't be long because I, I want to leave as much opportunity for questions to be asked and to be answered as well. Uh, in our last meeting, we had this question. It asks, what is being done to conserve and enhance the social and community fabric that has developed in the last 10 years in Little B? And this, this is a quite important question as the social and gender aspects of the project, we, we see it as quite, quite important. Um, so if I speak a bit to the environmental and social management plan, the ESMP that has been developed for this project, it outlines a number of measures and actions that will, impl that will be implemented to mitigate against any negative impact on our community. As a result, there are ongoing stakeholder engagements, and we have met and will continue to meet with different focus groups, as I mentioned earlier, such as the business owners. We have, we have done that already. We have met with the swimmers. We have met with the fisher folks. Uh, I know our community liaison officer in the person of Dr. Burns have been out in our community and doing one-on-one, -on -one, meeting with the public one one on one, meeting with the community one on one. And you know, to ensure that the fabric of our community is preserved. As we have developed as a project team that community progress is our purpose. And so we have partnered with Stantec, our our resident engineer and our consultants, as their their team is the design with community in mind. And so these are some very key elements as we meet with the environment, as we look at ways and means we can preserve, you know, what is Montserrat? What is Little Bay? What, what is our community? Um, within that environmental and social management plan, there's focus on no harm to the environment, no harm to the community as well. So out of the focus groups, we we um, are seeing that there is an urgent need for us to describe a scope that is even wider than the immediate project itself. There's an urgent need for that, for us to discuss around other development, other infrastructures, other enabling factors that are required to en enhance the whole port development in itself. So we'll continue to, do, to look at that. Um, the grievance redress mechanism is an important element of ensuring that our community fabric is preserved. And so it's, it's designed for us to receive complaints, to, to look at comments and, and ways and means that we can do things differently, or whether anyone personally is being impacted by, by the project or activities that are ongoing in the project. 
Another tool that has been used is the Social and Gender Action Plan, and that is being implemented with consideration to gender sensitivities and social inclusion as well. For example, um, we know that our contractor Meridian Construction Company Limited is a multinational company, and we do have persons, employees from right across the globe as far as Australia, isn't that so, Peter? As far as Australia, my good friend Rob, who is, is out, of, out of Canada. And we do have personnel from across the region as well, Antigua, Trinidad, Jamaica, I believe, as well. And of course, local employees, Monstrations, as well. There are a number of Monstrations that are being employed on the project. And so that has to be taken into consideration, it being a multinational company, and as a result, the contractor is obligated to do training in the areas of human trafficking, drug abuse, child labor, sexually transmitted diseases, etc. And so indeed, um, the project is indeed taken into consideration ways and means we can protect the social fabric of our community, especially the one that is directly within the project site, a little bit. The second question I would want to touch on is that of, would there be a conflict of operations with passengers and cargo? And this question came out of one of our focus group with the business owners within the Little Bay region. Um, and this we have discussed at length previously. I've had recent discussion as well with the port management. And we do meet with the port management on a, on a biweekly basis to look at their operations, to look at how the ongoing works would impact their operations and their management system. But in response to this question, we realize that the new pair will provide the port with more flexibility as cruise passengers will be accommodated on, on the new facilities, while the existing jetty will be, able to, will be available to handle cargo especially. And even more so, um, they're currently doing some judging around that existing structure, uh, which would allow for a deeper draft, even for larger vessels to be, to be able to come into to that jetty with their, with their cargo. Other considerations are that in general, as part of active management, the port will give priority to passengers and won't necessarily handle both passengers and cargo at the same time, so they look at their schedule. It means that they will look at their schedule. Um, if there's a, a cruise in the harbor, then the container ship would, would wait until they have dealt with, with the cruise. Um, this is also an international practice as well. Um, we have seen, even in Cayman Island, where tourism is much more fledging than in Montserrat, and you have a lot more cruise vessels coming in, that cruise passengers are given priority and the cargo are handled handle strictly at nights. So indeed, there, there's way forward for them. Um, I mean, we would continue to discuss other means and ways where we can improve on the management system to ensure that there's not too much interaction with cargo and cruise passengers. And I will leave it there. Thank you. Um, I think Rob is coming next. Okay, and so um, while Rob is coming, I just want to touch on some of the other areas that we've been using to engage our public. I know you would have heard our voice on, on the morning show with Basil as well. That was last Thursday. Um, and Saturday as well, we were on, on the cultural show with Rose, and we spoke at length around what is happening on the project and some of the expectations. Uh, this coming Thursday, we'll be on Mali Vibes, and we'll be more focused around the elements of the environment. We'll be talk, talking about the bat monitoring, the bird monitoring, and also the coral relocation as well. So we'll hear more about that. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Robert Burdage, and as was mentioned, I'm the resident engineer and the engineer's representative for Stantec. And Stantec provides consulting to assist the design and also monitor construction, and we also provide opinions when it relates to disputes and claims from the contractor. So we've been in the, Stantec has been involved in the project for about 
four years plus now, and we're taking it all the way through to the end. So we're happy to be here. And before I get started, I'd just like to comment on the media and the music we had before, the, before this evening's event, and I thought it was great. So thank you for that. So. <clears throat> So last session in March, we had several questions that we noted that were not answered, and the primary reason being we were focused on what's happening, but we realized the audience had other questions and we wrote them down and we summarized them here. So the questions that we thought were notable that we're prepared to answer tonight are the following. Uh, will, will the new pier be as good or better than the one we had in Plymouth? Uh, what does the budget allow for? Uh, what vessels are are going to be mooring at the new pier. Uh, what's going to happen to the scum? And I think that's just a question about turbidity and if there's going to be enough uh, action to keep the area clean in the future. What are dedicated to freight and what for people? What part is? And we'll go over that with some, with some uh, diagrams in a moment here. How tall is the area where there is a wall for the bit of breakwater? We have some sections we'll show and then what is Phase one and phase two, we had a lot of discussions last town hall. What's phase one and phase two? So we're currently building phase one, and we'll show you what that looks like shortly. So to answer the first question, um, what is the difference between the existing pier at Plymouth and the new one? This one is the existing pier. It's a drawing. This is captured from the existing drawings. The portion of the existing pier that we made that's functional right now is this 70 some 72 meters pier. Can you see that? Okay, maybe I can use my, my, okay. How's that? Does that work better? So we have the existing existing pier at 72 meters. Okay, all good. Right now, the, the water line is approximately right here. So this existing structure, which was a bridge, is now covered in ash from a volcano. So we, we have functioning right now this, this area. And it's heavily silted. So the, the uh, draft requirements are very shallow. Some vessels still come here on this edge. So we have about 72 meters. Now compare that to what, what's happening. The pro this is a proposed pier here with 130 meters of new construction plus roll-on, roll-off ramp here, a smaller breakwater, and then we have a dolphin out here, and this is for mooring large vessels. So uh, we can see that if this was functioning fully before the volcano, we had some very large cargo ships and cruise ships. The, the capacity, the, the tonnage of the new, of the vessels for this pier is smaller. However, it's rather still significant, and these are, in terms of cruise ships, it's the mid-sized cruise ship which would be, this one here is one of the larger ones, which is the windsurf, 160, 1,600 tons, 187 meters long. And you can see the bow sprit is out here. This is a mooring dolphin. So when this large ship docks, it can berth against the pier and it can tie off <coughs> to the dolphin. And then in addition to that, there's other uh, ships, a 300 passenger ferry, and that diagram is right here, the 300 <coughs> passenger ferry. We also have a smaller cruise ship, which is the Sea Dream 2, which is 108 meters long, and also cargo ships or container ships that are as many as 120. And this is an example of at this time for phase one, there's a possibility when sea conditions allow that you can berth on the seaward side. So that's the first question answered. And I think we'll go through all of this and at the end we'll have questions that way we get through the whole topic. So phase one and phase two. This is the diagram that I just showed you a minute ago, which is the proposed construction which is happening today. This is a smaller breakwater portion. This is the access road and the roll-on, roll-off, roll-roll ramp. This is a rendering of phase two, which shows the breakwater for the full length of this pier. And this pier is even extended by 30 meters, and the breakwater wraps around the end of it. However, this is not entirely correct because there's a five meter wall that shows on our drawings. But for example, right here in this cross section, this is our current pier design right here. 
This is the breakwater, which is intended to be this structure here, and there's a five meter wall, which doesn't show on this diagram. This is for future construction. The only portion of the breakwater that's happening is this region right here. Okay. Just for reference, this is the uh, pier that we just mentioned, and this is the effective length that's usable. This portion is usable, and you can see this bridge is completely covered. So just for references, we wanted to show you a, a Google Earth photo of the existing pier. So what's going to happen to the scum? Will there be a need to dredge every 20 years? Can you swim out to it? Yes. So as we mentioned before, that any structure that has a sandy bottom with, with, a, with an moving water will have depositions of sand. And so this will happen all the time. So piers over time will need maintenance. And, and the question is how much is, is unknown at this time. But this existing pier is being dredged right now because there, there was deposition that did occur already. So we're dredging out, taking it from perhaps three or four meters down to five meters along the existing pier. So yes, there will be an ongoing maintenance regime required to make sure that the draft is available for adequate moorage. Number two, <clears throat> let's see, did I answer every question? Oh, what's going to happen to the scum? This is, a, this is a question about, which is a rather difficult question to answer, and we don't have the exact answers, but the question really relates to what kind of uh, motion of the water will be on the leeward side or the the protected side of the pier, will it be moving around enough so that it, it's changed frequently enough so that it doesn't grow algae? And it's not certain what that is. It's likely there won't be a problem, but, but it's an unknown until actually the final condition is in place. What, are, what part is dedicated to freight and what for people? Both sides of the pier are available under favorable sea conditions. And uh, certainly the pier is designed for cruise ships that we discussed and cargo as well. And we, um, we talked a, a little bit about this. Um, downtime is really, this question relates to what we refer to as down to how much time can, the, or is it too turbulent or the seas are too rough to have safe moorage? With this new pier, the downtime will, will be actually about half what it was previous. And we've actually done a study on this in the summer months, we expect the downtime would be about 3% of the time, and in the winter months, about 16% of the time, which is currently about half of what we're experiencing today, from what I've learned. Um, key successes, success factors and outcomes. Um, just what we said, downtime will be reduced on the leeward side of the new pier for both phases. Okay, wave heights will be substantially reduced, again, because this new pier is essentially a breakwater, it's a gravity structure. And fishing boats, yeah. it's, I think it's time for, Peter, is it yeah. time for you to step in? Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Oh, welcome everyone, thank you for coming. Apologies. Uh, for the accent, I'll do my best to speak uh, the Queen's English. We'll see how we go. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So here is a, a dredging plan. We, we showed it last time uh, at the town hall. We, we have changed a little bit with, uh, with Piper's Pond. We have decided not to do a, the temporary facility that we were planning on doing. Uh, we looked at the efficiencies of, uh, of that facility and deemed it not, uh, not required anymore. What you can see here in the blue is the approach channel, the, the, the long path, that we'll dredge to minus eight chart datum. And when we say minus eight chart datum, we, we work in, uh, in metres. So zero is uh, just, just below uh, the low, low tide by about 20 centimetres or so. And uh, the top of the pier will be plus three metres. So if we talk about minus eight, we're talking about, uh, about 11 metres from the top of the pier will be where the dredge level would be. And that, that's the area you see there. Underneath the, the pier footprint that Robert's shown some uh, plans of, we have to go a little bit deeper and there's some fine sands there that will liquefy during an earthquake uh, situation. So we have to remove them and replace that with competent sand. So that's why you see a little bit of a rectangle in that area there. And then the green area was the, uh, the area both Rolston and uh, Robert uh, 
addressed earlier that we're currently um, dredging there and we'll get a little bit more depth. So it's the part of the existing pier and we're, we're getting down there. We're, we're doing the near shore or the near pier uh, dredging at the moment. When we get some additional equipment that can be on the water, we'll then continue and, and make the approach way for that area as well. But you know, shortly we hope to have a berth that the, the port will be able to use to bring some bigger vessels in and then we'll expand on that as well. One key point we have here, and, and I know it's something that Rolson and Dr Burns are uh, working through, is there are the, the fish boat moorings that are currently to the west of where the new pier will be. Um, in the coming weeks, we're going to have to move them. So in consultation with the government, we'll get the direction of where they need to go and, and what needs to happen with them. But it's important that we, we raise that because we'll be bringing in a vessel. Uh, the plan is for, for the end of the month to bring in a vessel that will, uh, will start the dredging works and she'll be quite a large vessel and she'll come in and do sweeping runs and uh, suck the sand up. The best way to explain it is like a vacuum cleaner. We just have an arm that will go down to the seabed, it will suck up the, the sand and then we'll go and dispose at it at the sea. So this is a, a photo of, of such a vessel that, uh, that may come to site here. So we, we hope in the coming weeks we'll have a vessel such as this and she can come and complete the, the bulk of the dredging and, and get us down to the depth of what we need so that once the, the pier is built then the, the larger vessels and cruise ships can come into the new pier. So that, that's uh, the, the dredging that we, we plan to do. Uh, next we want to talk about the principal pier movement. So for Meridian we're EPC contractor which means we're in engineering procurement and construction. So we get given a set of plans, something similar to this with conditions and specifications and we're told to you know, refine the engineering, actually design the structure you know, make it economical for both procurement and construction. And we currently are working with the government and Stantec with a proposal about the pier, and we discussed, uh, discussed this roughly uh, the last town hall. And what we have here is we, we've split the project into two areas, one being the causeway uh, that goes to the pier, and then one being the pier and the row row ourselves. So there's a number of items here that we're discussing. There's obviously the bluff that we're all aware of and the dangers that it could uh, pose to us building the facility, but also for the use during the, uh, the life of the facility. And it's a very hard uh, for the engineers, the geotech engineers, to really give us firm data on that. They can go and do inspections and give us some reports and their, their recommendations. So that's one, uh, one item where we're managing. And the second one is obviously you see a cliff, you see a mountain above the, the water below the water is not too different. So, you know, that, that rock continues. So in the area we want to build the, the row row ramp, there's actually a lot of under, underwater rock. And, you know, that's an additional expense for everyone that we're trying to alleviate. So we're currently looking at, do we keep the uh, row row, to keep the facility as it is with the red line, which is per tender? Do we move it out 10 metres, which would give us a little bit more safety to the bluff and reduce some of the rock excavation? or do we move it out to where the green area is, which at the moment is between 20 and 25 metres. And what that would do for the pier and the row row, it would give us a, a, a safety uh, zone for the bluff. It would eliminate any rock dredging, so environmental risks that go along with that, the additional cost, the additional time, the noise, etc. cetera. Um, and we're, we're hoping that we'll, we can come up with uh, a solution that uh, gives more bang for buck and also a better value for the project long term. The second part is in the causeway, not so much for the rock dredging but more for the safety of the, the, the cliff that's there, that we try and have some uh, uh, extended buffer zone so when vehicles are going up and down that causeway during the life of the project that a rock, if it does fall, there'll be a ditch there to catch it and not to hit a, hit a vehicle or hit a truck. So we're working through that. I think it's an important aspect we're working with the government and part of our contract is value engineering and to see how can we save money but how can we add value to the project as well. So. Over the coming week or two, we hope, we hope to have a decision there and then we can start to move forward. That does not change the length of the pier, does not change the width of the pier or the, the specifications of it. It just simply moves the pier either further away from the, uh, from the bluff, creating more of a buffer zone uh, along the, the bluff here. To give a little bit of an understanding of what we're talking, um, this is a, a photo we took earlier on in the year. It's not quite what uh, site looks like now. Now I'll show uh, next slide what site currently looks like. But a uh, nice thing about this uh, photo here is the red lines are roughly where the pier would be. So uh, for those we're talking about the, the mooring of the uh, fishing boats that we have to move. You know, we've got the finger pier, the finger uh, there on the bluff. 
a few rocks which have now moved and uh, it gives you an idea of where the new pier would be. Obviously you can see the, the bottom of the uh, existing one right there. So leaping forward to, I think this was taken on two days ago. So this is where we're currently doing with the existing, uh, well with the, the new works. So this is temporary works, this is not quite yet part of the permanent works. We're still working through to get the final drawings and approval from the government. But to explain to people what we're actually doing at the moment, so we've built a small rock platform next to the existing uh, pier. So that would be allow for us to bring off a large crane that we have from Antigua and then all the rock and material that we need to build the causeway, build the pier, we can bring a barge in and, and bring it straight off there and keep it within sight without trying to put too many trucks in the road. The second one you will see a roadway that's coming down the screen. That's a temporary access road. So that's allowing us to get down to where the lightning bolt is and the lightning bolt is we'll put in a temporary breakwater. As many of you know, the seas can get quite rough in that area. So before we start building the permanent works, we want to try and offer ourselves a little bit of protection. So we're not having to constantly rework the, uh, the works that we're doing. So currently we're moving out. We've actually moved uh, past the, the, the rock that's in the water at the moment. And our aim is to get uh, just near that lightning bolt. And then we have a platform there to do a, a breakwater for, uh, for protection. Important uh, item we want to get out to the community is along this red line here, we've put uh, some red buoys and that's to delineate our construction zone. And the reason that's quite important is, you know, we're working there with an excavator, we may have some uh, other equipment in there shortly, and we need to have a safety barrier so when the excavator is working, if it's putting rock in the water or so, and if one of those rocks roll or it's moving around, that it doesn't cause any da danger or harm to the public. So our request is, you know, please, if you see those red Norwegian boys and they're roughly in that, that shape and they come back to the bluff, please don't go past that area. You'll see they're red, they've got MCCL written on them. You know, and if you do need to come into that area, please contact the port or, or ourselves or the project team and we can uh, have that discussion about what you need to do to move into that area. But it's very important that we keep that buffer zone so we don't cause any injury to, to anyone. I mean, part of that, the ongoing environmental uh, monitoring we're doing, we're also got our monitor out there looking for the animals, for the, any marine mammals as well. Um, the dredging that we're doing at the end of the existing pier there, you can see with the yellow silk curtain, we're also doing water testing, etc., to make sure we minimise any, uh, any effect on the environment. Obviously, unfortunately, we will have some effect on the environment, but our aim is to minimise uh, that as uh, low as possible. No, but I can, I can do what Robert did. Hopefully the, the speakers will be a little bit better. Okay. So just to explain, this was the construction zone here. This, this is the, the roadway, that uh, the temporary roadway we're, we're bringing down. We're about here at the moment. And this will be a temporary breakwater that we build. This one? This one here? That, that, that's where we're doing the existing uh, pier dredging. Yeah. Yeah, correct. Great. So we, we're only dredging the one side here and to make that deeper. So as I said, we talk chart datum metres. So that pier is uh, about plus two metres chart datum and we're taking it down to about five, uh, minus five metres chart datum. Okay, to, to talk a little bit about the, the new pier, this is uh, a typical section. We're, we're working through further refining this, so at this stage we're hoping to remove these, these ties in the, in the middle. As Robert alluded to, it's a, uh, a gravity structure which works off mass. Uh, we've got two rows of, of caissons, um, one row here, one row here, and then there's an institute slab that is connecting it together. At the bottom I talked a little bit about the dredging where we had to remove additional material and this is this material here that we remove and we'll replace with more suitable material. Um, what's quite special about this is, is we call it a modular caisson system. It's uh, quite unique in the world. Normally when we do caissons, we do quite large caissons which would be the full height and the full size of this and we'd have some big vessels and big equipment to bring it in and, and land it uh, in position. With the water depths we're dealing with and with the size of the project, that wasn't viable. So we came up with this solution to, uh, to be able to give the same uh, results at the end of the day. 
We have changed. I know some drawings that you would have seen in the past would have been tubular piles and sheet piles. We have changed that due to some concerns about the rock and again for the, for the value of the, of the project to give something that's better environmentally friendly when we construct it. We're not using diesel hammers or hammers to, to uh, pound the, hammers, the piles into the ocean. And secondly, the corrosion allowance for concrete is a lot better than with steel. Steel, you would have had some uh, repair works over the years, even though we had you know, a concrete precast unit around the top in the tidal zone where a lot of corrosion occurs. With the concrete, we've tried to reduce that to make it uh, a very, say, maintenance-free structure to a certain extent with regards to the, the structural elements. So that, that's a little bit what a typical pier will look like. The, these items here, these are rock anchors. So that, you know, that just provides extra strength to the structure to hold itself down. So when we do get the, the, the larger weather loads on it, that it's able to secure itself to the ground and not move. So th this is the structure on the, uh, on the side view of it. So this is the pier, let's say, going out. Um, all the blocks that you saw, so there'd be one row and a second row behind that. Best way to explain to people that have seen a brick house, it's very similar to, to a brick house with the, the stacking of the, the blocks. Um, and then we have the rock anchors that I've talked about later that will go through here. We've got some dows as well. Um, and then we fill inside the blocks on both sides and we fill in the middle as well. The next one's quite important just to explain is the pier and row row. So we call this the pier. So as Robert was explaining, we only do a short breakwater here and we leave the outside of the pier open. Phase two will close that with a, uh, with a breakwater, but at the moment we'll put some fenders and some bollards there. So when the weather is favourable, it is a second berth for, for the community to use. And then this will be the main inside berth here. And this will be a row row ramp. So very similar to what you see in the existing pier. We have at the end of the existing pier, there's a, there's a ramp there, so the ships can land their ramps. This is what we will construct here. And this is roughly about 20 metres by 20 metres, and there'll be a ramp there. So the vessels that you see coming in now with the containers on there, they can come there, they can drive off there and, and, uh, and come around to the port. Th this area here is what I was discussing earlier about the offset, so we wouldn't change the dimensions of the structure here. We would simply move this whole structure you know, forwards, you know, whatever direction we, we get for that. And uh, we'll create a, a larger buffer zone here. So the, the bluff that's here, if any rocks fall down or any issues we have here, we've moved the whole pier out away from that. So that's currently what we're looking into. D down here? Yeah, correct. This is, this is the road. So if I go back to this drawing here. So we had zoomed in in this area here. And then that, that's the road back to the port. So that's the existing pier here, and then that's the port area there. So if I show you on, I show you on this photo here, that's the area we're looking at here, and that's the roadway there back to the port. There's the existing, uh, existing pier. So the, the last slide we have for tonight is just to talk about the, the next key steps that we have in the project. Um, with the design, we've talked about the pier movement. That's quite important to get that, uh, that finalised so we can update our drawings, especially with the dredging commencing in the coming weeks. Um, we've also got to get our 60% design package, which goes beyond the concept and refines the details. So we're working with, uh, with our designers. So we have designers in Houston who are as a design team there working. They've also got some support from designers in Seattle. Um, we've got some independent designers in Holland who are looking at this design and also looking at temporary works as well. Secondly is the existing pier. So we have uh, the dredging that's ongoing, as, as we've discussed. We've set it up for our construction bar barges. There's some, some small detailing to do to finish that off. We're on to permanent material ordering and testing. So at this stage, the testing that we had for the aggregates has been... Uh, deemed by our designers not to be suitable for the concrete. So we are looking to go to, uh, overseas to bring the aggregate in, unfortunately, for the concrete. And then we're starting to look at ordering the structural members, so the rock anchors, um, cement, rebar, et cetera, et cetera, that we would get, uh, get them ordered and get them to the island. Main dredging, so at the end of the month, you know, pending uh, the availability of the dredger, is we'd bring that dredger in and start those uh, operations, hence 
in the coming weeks, we, you know, week or two, we need to start clearing Little Bay and making, uh, making the, the area available for the dredger. We've also got arrival of additional equipment coming, so we've bought a uh, concrete batch plant from uh, Turkey that will, uh, will be uh, landing. We've also bought uh, concrete trucks and concrete pumps from Switzerland to arrive here. Um, we've got a long reach excavator coming from Holland. Uh, we've got a lot of equipment coming from, uh, from quite a few countries, so we've got to get that to, to Montserrat so we can start the construction. Um, the next one that's uh, key steps in the, in the short term is the causeway. So we've talked about the temporary access road and break, breakwater that we're building. Then it's, we envision in the coming weeks, once we can get hold of a stockpile of material from Plymouth, along with the riprap and get the design approved for the causeway with the peer movement resolution, is to start actually the permanent works for that causeway. So depending on the outcome, that causeway will go out you know, potentially 10 to 15 metres of what we're building at the moment. And then we can actually start that causeway and have the first part of the permanent works um, commencing. Should yeah, the corals we've, we've actually finished today, so we've, uh, we've moved on from, from there, but uh, I'll try and find. We, we had, uh, Stantec uh, had done two dives um, to identify corals in the area. So we had been given an instruction, there was a group of coral in this area, and there was a group of coral just in front of uh, Potato Hill, where we had sent our divers down to move the, the coral to relocation sites that were over in Rendezvous Bay and also in front of the Cars Bay. So we, we got given an instruction to move, I think we ended up moving about 85 corals or so, um, and then uh, we, we completed that today. We'll follow up with inspections over the course of the next year to see how they survived and, and how well they were going, and I believe there might be further works undertaken by the government to try and uh, do additional works this month to, to see what else can be, uh, be done to recover any remaining coral. I don't, sorry. Did you want to move on to questions or? Thank you very much, Mr. Patterson, Mr. Bodaj and Mr. Watanafa. Uh, apparently most people are online today. Mr. Patterson, were you able to get any online questions? Uh, there was one, one question. Okay, and the floor is open for questions. Okay. So good evening again and to our online listeners and viewers. I see that there was one question with regard to whether or not the tendering for this project was open to locals. And yes, um, it was an open process. It was open for locals, for international companies. Uh, it was not necessarily a criteria for the funding agency for, for it to be an outside company. But once there was a local company that provided the capacity, the experience, and have the, 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 the wherewithal to make this project a success. Yeah, but um, unfortunately, there, there wasn't any local company that bid, bid for this project. I know some, at least one local company um, partner with an outside company in, in, in the bidding process to, to a certain extent. So that was the only question that I really picked up online so far. Good afternoon. Pardon my ignorance, but um, you kept talking about dredging. I have one simple question. When you dredge, that would make the area deeper, will it? What effect does the, deep, the, the deeper area have on the flow of water for the rest of the area? That's a 
It's a good question. It's a, it's a rather simple question, but a difficult answer. Um, when you do uh, increase the depth of the water, the dynamics change. Uh, you know, so the currents come in, the swell, the wave action, uh, everything changes when you do that. And so the biggest change that's going to happen is the construction of the new pier. So when we have the new pier constructed, it will calm the waters in this region here. It's deeper, but it will be calmer. So there will be a change. Now, there will be deposition of silt over time, and we don't exactly know exactly the pattern of deposition of silt, but it's likely to happen. Um, so when you do dredge, uh, you definitely change the dynamics of the, of the flow of water, and some of that is an uncertain condition. The beach, how will that affect the beach, the, the sandy beach that we've got, that, that little bit there? Again, it's a hydrodynamic concern, and uh, the expectation, because the water is calmer here, that you're, you're going to have a calmer situation here over time. Every day will be calmer than it was in the past, and there might be some deposition of sand coming in that may have to be maintained over a long period of time, not in the near future, but perhaps over 10 or 20 years. But, so the expectation is, is that the, the beach will still be the beach, it'll be calmer, it'll be safer, and it'll still be quite usable. That's the expectation. Could any of the materials for the aggregate or the, the concrete be obtained from locally? So I'll bring up the, the drawing so we can uh, discuss it in detail. Just quickly before I answer that question, just to tail on uh, the end of Rolson's answer about local companies. I think it's clear, even though I have an Australian company, like Australian accent, uh, we're a BVI based uh, company. So uh, Meridian Construction is based in BVI. They're working in Antigua. We have a dredging company in Antigua. We're obviously in the Montserrat project. There's a, a project in Barbados. We've been in St. Lucia. So uh, St. Kitts, the dredging is happening. So you know, while we're from BVI and we have international people in the, in the company, the, the owners of, uh, of Meridian are, are based in BVI. They've been there for the last 30, 40 years, you know, and they're, they're from the Caribbean. So, you know, while we're not from Montserrat, you know, the company is from the Caribbean and, and we're trying to bring in the resources to support the growth of Meridian and use more and more uh, local labour and staff from the Caribbean. We're doing some training. We have engineers with us from uh, Antigua, uh, surveyors from uh, Jamaica. Um, we've got, we're looking to onboard some interns locally from Montserrat, from BVI as well. So we're trying to incorporate the community, the Caribbean community into it. So please don't think that because you see me uh, as an Australian and my accent, that the, the company is foreign. The company is from, from uh, the Caribbean. I'll, I'll talk about it. It was about local materials. So this is the, this is the, the caissons here. So on the outside here is the concrete. So you can see where, where it's white, that, that is concrete. Unfortunately, that material will most likely come from abroad, being the cement, being the aggregate and the sand, and the, and the rebar with reinforcement steel. And that's due to some testing that we've completed and based on the requirements in the contract, we have to ensure that the, the concrete is competent, it's durable, it lasts the time of, uh, that's required under the contract for the pier. So we are going to have to bring in the material for that concrete on the inside here, where you see the, the light grey here and here, it is our plan to use the uh, material from Plymouth or from the south side of the, the island, using the local resources out of there, you know, the sand miners that are there to give them the contracts to be able to supply us with the, uh, the material to fill within the caissons and also the armour rock. So we've even got some scour protection, which is rock that we intend to use as much as we can from the island. Also, if we have a look here, this rock here, we're currently looking at the design where we can simplify it and use more natural resources instead of making 
concrete units to see what we can do with the, the stone that's available on the island and also by changing that design allowing the possibilities that when it does come to phase two that it could be done by local, local contractors as well because of the way the design is and how we'll use the, the ocean to finalise the slope there. So, uh, then another point to point out is all this material here that we're currently using is being trucked from Plymouth. That's not our full term plan to you know, have trucks running on the roads all the time causing you know, congestion with the traffic and, and any damage. But at the moment to get us moving forward, we, we have the trucks coming from Plymouth supplying all this material. Uh, in the future, it's our intention to use a barge from Plymouth and bring the barge in here and then we can bring all this material for the backfill and all the armour rock. So I hope that answers your question. Sorry, Plymouth Jetty. It's been loaded onto barges at the Plymouth Jetty and it's coming from the current... Sorry, the people, the, the material you're bringing from Plymouth, mm -hmm. is it just stones that have been collected by people working there or is, the, is it material coming from the existing jetty in Plymouth? No, so it is coming from the sand mines that are currently set up, so we're engaging, oh, okay. we're engaging the okay. sand miners to you know, provide local jobs and to give them part of the, the, uh, the project as well. So where they currently get the material from is where we'll get the material from. Can I, while I have the mic, can I just ask an, um, another question? Um, the existing jetty will remain once this project is completed? To, to our knowledge, yes. That, that's yes. why we're doing the dredging. Also, on top of the dredging, we are going to install some new fenders on the existing um, pier so that there's better uh, berthing uh, conditions for vessels coming in. And... Um, I think the other question is for um, the, the Stantec um, engineer. Um, do you recall what you, your last statement that you ended your presentation is? Did you say that you said the new pier is essentially a, and I didn't catch the last word. It sounded like it ended with water. Did you say the new pier is essentially a breakwater? Yes, I did. I, I said the, the new pier is a, is a gravity structure, and I think we have a sketch of that. Uh, the water line is here, and this is a massive structure that's a gravity structure, and it behaves like a breakwater. We, we sometimes just think of breakwater as a pile of rocks, but this essentially is a big rock. You can think of it as a monster rock. It is a breakwater. And if you have the sea coming in this way, that's why we have this armor here. When the sea comes this way, this will be calmer, quite a bit calmer. Okay, I'm very confused yes. as to what, what is, what, in what direction the, the pier is, is going and what it, we're north, I, I'm not quite sure what's north, south, east, and west. So the, 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 new, the new pier is, par, is perpendicular, what is it? This, this is a, right here is the existing pier. That's the existing it shows pier. shows the scale of the existing pier right here. The new one, you can see the size, it's quite a bit larger. Here it is here. Okay, so it isn't around. quite perpendicular no. to, to. The, the, the new pier existing is this way. Okay, so and it isn't it. quite parallel either. Correct, it is not parallel. It's, it's an optimization of the sea conditions, trying to make sure that we can have the calmest waters that we can for the given size of the pier. Okay, and um, what, what is, where is south of, of the new pier? Uh, pardon me? If you could just point to me where south of the new pier is. South, this yeah. is north is this way, in this direction. Uh -huh. This is the south face, so we call it the leeward face, which is the protected side. This is the seaward face, where we get all the sea and bad weather. This is the protected side, we call the leeward side. Okay, so the boats would be docking on that side, the southward side. Under favorable conditions, we can dock on each, each side. When it's a little bit rough, we can dock on this side only. 
Okay, and one, um, well, two other questions. Um, I wrote to ask a question about this project, and I was told that you were building a wharf. Is wharf and pier and jetty, are the, all those the same thing? Uh, actually, a wharf, by definition, is something that is parallel to the coastline, and a pier is perpendicular. And a jetty is a small pier. Okay, so what is it that you're building? We're building a pier. We call a it a pier. pier. Yeah. It, it's, it's not a wharf. No, a wharf would be, if we, if we turn this and made it parallel to the, to the shoreline, it would be a wharf. Okay, and the second to the last question, the dolphin, is it a definite? It's included in the project? The mooring dolphin? It is included in the project, which allows for the longer vessels to okay, be moored. So it isn't just proposed. And this relates to the training aspect. Who is going to be trained? Who, I'm sorry, who is going to be trained in trafficking and the other areas that? Um, I'm not sure if it, if it was the government representative or you that said there would be training. I, I didn't understand the relevance. Okay, the, the contractors train their workers, because you remember you have people coming in, so that's part of the orientation to Montserrat, oh, to make okay. sure that they abide by our rules and laws, yeah. Yes. Because I think Mr. Patterson was trying to tell you, this is not just the physical structure, but there's social and environmental impacts as well. So we train the work, not we, the contractor is responsible for training the workers so that they can live in our community. You got a lot of mileage out of that session, that's for sure. Yeah, thank you. I, I wanted to make a, a suggestion, and I think it's borne out by some of the questions that Ms. Ms. White asked, and that is that your presentations to date are, in my view, uh, I'm going to use the word subpar in terms of what you're showing us. For a project costing what, what is it, $70 million or what, what? $90 million, we should have CGI by now. We should have computer-generated graphics on the screen that shows us what the area looks like from the land, okay? I am very much interested, for example, in how the area will look after the pier is constructed and I'm sitting at Moose's restaurant or at Benny's. How will it look? Will I be able to sit at Benny's and take photos of the sunset still? Or will there be a massive structure in front of us? It, it might sound simple to some people, but let's say somebody was investing in the area and they're developing, maybe they're buying out one of the bars or something of that nature. But in a year's time, there will be a structure in front of them. It needs to be contextualized, so to speak, so that you know what you're getting into. Because it might be a case where you're saying, well, no, I'm not going to buy the bar where Benny's is or Moose. I will go over to Pontine in the other bay, part of the bay because I will now have an unobstructed view of the whole, the, the, the sunset and, and, and the, the you, you, know, you understand what I'm saying? So I, I'm, I'm, suggesting, I'm suggesting that going forward, a little bit more effort, and I, I, I don't think it costs that much more, it will cost a little money, but some more usable images are shown to, to, the, to the common man, to us, so that we can see what is going on there in Little Bay. Patterson, this, this one is for you. It, it came in to me. I don't know why they didn't send it straight to you but if somebody's watching online and they're asking the question, um, you know those rocks that were placed in front of Benny's restaurant area, scoreboard area, and they were trying to create a, a calm area for, for a beach and that failed spectacularly after about a year. So the question is, is not obviously not necessarily to the port people, but to the government of Montserrat, are there any plans to remove those rocks such that the beach comes back how it was, given that it will now be calmer because of the breakwater pier that we're getting. Thank, thank, thank you, sir, for the, for the question. 
Um, I'll be honest in saying I don't know of any immediate plans to do that, but as we are looking at protecting the social fabric, the beach, and, and that sort of thing, that is a pretty good suggestion that we can look at. But I can tell you coming out of the focus groups, um, especially with the fisher folk, the fishermen, they have spoken to um, a need of having their own facility. They recognize their security issues in terms of, and protocols in terms of entering the port facility to, to get to their fishing vessels and so on. So they would like to have a separate facility where they don't necessarily have to go through the port gate to get to, get to their fishing vessels. So even that would have to take into consideration and where we would locate such a facility. So yes, that we can look at, I mean, it indeed didn't function as, as was expected, in, in, in my view. And so we, we definitely can look at that. Uh, meanwhile, I'm on the podium, there's... Definitely, um, I'm hoping that by our next town hall meeting that we could have some better image. I know there is one on this slide, which, but it doesn't totally depict um, the current structure, it depicts the, the structure in its entirety with the breakwater right, right along. Not, not only that, it's Showing us a view from the sea. None okay. of us are in the sea, okay. so we can't get the, the so, contextualized so, so, view. So definitely we, 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 we're working on that. that, that has been worked on. And um, we, we're hoping that by the next town hall meeting that we, we have some better images so that we can present and folks can have a better understanding of what is happening. Added to that, we um, do expect us to have some um, other packages coming out that will demonstrate what exactly is happening online. Um, things like how judging would take place, what caissons would look like, and I'm hoping that caissons will soon become a household word, especially for our children and for other persons in, in, in the community. Just to put a finer point on what I was saying about the visualization, it would be useful if even now we could see where the end of the pier will be. You know, if, if, if I'm sitting on the beach, where is the end of the pier? Right. You, you understand what I'm saying? Because we, 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 we don't know what 140 meters looks like. Where will 140 meters end up from where you start to in the water? Okay. Such that we could. So, so we take those suggestions on board and we definitely would, would try and, and um, produce some additional um, imagery for the next meeting, but quickly, Quickly, um, there's a, a question online. Uh, so there was a concern about the smallness of the breakwater. Will this be in the second phase? Um, yes, uh, as mentioned earlier, the second phase um, is intended to have the entire outer walls be in line with what we would call the breakwater in, in some terms. But these are the large concrete pieces on, and the large boulders. And, is there sufficient funding available for that? Clearly not, not. There's not sufficient funding available now for that, because if that was available, it would have been something we would want to do right away. And there's a question with regard to, did, didn't I respond to concern that the new pair will entertain more than one cruise ship or the largest of them? And so I can, in, in the earlier presentation, um, Robert spoke to being able to host at least two vessels, one on the inside and one on the outside. Um, the outside one would depend on, on the weather conditions as well. And in terms of size, we are currently hosting um, vessels up to 187 meters in, in length. So that would be the expected largest vessel that we, we would um, accommodate on the new structure. Thank you. And in, well, the person is saying, oh, indeed, that's, that's a benefit. I, I want to reiterate while the other questions are coming is that this structure in itself would provide, the new structure would provide a lot of protection for the existing jetty. And so in some of my presentation to, to our focus groups, I presented a video with the, the ferry. Yeah. So there, there's, a, there's a bit of imagery there of, of what the, the pair would look like. But in the first instance, you won't have all of these rubber um, structures on the outside. So it would then allow for 
vessels on, on both sides. So um, we're definitely are working towards having an improved imagery. And I was mentioning that, as, as you see here, this structure is indeed pro providing protection for the existing, existing pair. So situations where we're having the ferry coming in and, ha and have to return to Antigua, that is likely to lessen unless there are exceptional conditions. And in some of these exceptional conditions, um, the vessels obviously would not travel, crews wouldn't come, wouldn't come to our shores, they would try and find uh, a safe harbor where they can, can protect their ships, especially like hurricane conditions, very, very high seas. Thank you. Yes. Um, permit me to have a brief moment to ask or uh, comment. My name is Kenrick Hayward. I'm a Belgian monstration and a British monstration, <laughs> and uh, I'm a trade contractor and builder. I work here um, for quite some many years, and I'm glad to be here to listen. But I, I need you to help me to understand, because I, as a trained builder, I understand drawings. I, and I don't, can't really follow, because there's no finished drawing here that is saying that the government of Montserrat has a design and bill, and you have a contract to do that, just that, you will be able to provide us with the drawings that we can see exactly what you are going to give to us for that design and build money. And I have some concern because from what the gentleman there is saying, I, I'm not questioning your ability or anything, the, the movements of what you are showing us to this evening has serious implications for cost overruns. That is, financial cost overruns. Our government has told us that there has X amount of dollars to provide us with a design and build means uh, poor, meaning that you would have by this time a finished product. It would have passed through the, our, our public works department and they, they were satisfied that this is what we are going to get. Here where we are, we don't know what we are going to get. We are still fidgeting around with plans and plans, what you're saying to us, has serious implications for cost overruns. And I'm speaking as somebody that understands construction, understands drawings, and that sort of thing, and has worked here in Montserrat and understand what the government here requires. So if you could just help me to understand, because what you are saying, I'm not questioning your, what you are saying, all I'm saying, that we don't have no oil here in Montserrat. We don't have no diamonds or rubies. And you have given us a finished drawing that we can see. I will answer, I will answer his question then. We don't know what we are going to get. And as such, um, I, I also would like you to know if all the, these things that you have been telling us, which I have no problem with, if this fix, they're included in the fixed sum that you have tended for. One last thing. Procurement is not really, your procurement is not really attracting sympathy from ancestors like me and the others. Because we have had the pair and tongue built. And when it came to a time for procurement, there was 
the field there above the church in town given to them. And they had people bending steel, tying steel. The contractor had a, a place dredger south to bring in the, 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 the boat with all its equipment and this and that and the next. And we are not really seeing as a people no serious action in terms of the procurement strategy that you will uh, have for this job. And it, it bothers us as a people. Thank you. Sam, I, I might need my hands as well to, to point. So maybe to start very clearly how it started for Meridian as, as an EPC contractor. In very layman's terms, we were given a concept like this with some dimensions that were plus minus. We were given some concepts like this with again dimensions plus minus. It wasn't from our studies or from our uh, decisions to build a pier that was 130 metres long or 20 metres wide or without a full breakwater. We were given drawings and a scope that showed us what to build. The engineering we do is to take that concept that was developed by Stantec and to refine and to make it efficient based on the money that we, uh, we said we could build this project for. Because that risk is our risk. So if we have a look at these drawings here, this is our risk to build this. You know, it's our risk to ensure the concrete is, uh, is quality concrete, the tolerances in the caissons is built, the backfill is built. It's our risk and, and our uh, engineer, design engineer we have on board to prove to Stantec, to prove to the government that this works based on the dimensions they gave us and that in the design con uh, conditions they gave us that this pier will act as it should act. So there is no risk to the, the, the people of, of Montserrat for this design here because we have to make it work. And that was something we changed when, when we joined the project, is I'd previously come from a job in, in, uh, in Canada where we had steel piles and steel sheet piles, and trying to drill into that rock with those, we made, we made those steel sheet piles into accordions. So to ensure we didn't end up with a white elephant, it was something that the, the project team took on themselves to look at the design to reduce the risk, which again were, were our risk to deal with. Obviously, being a builder, you understand once you get under the ground, it becomes a, a little bit of hit and miss and there are some risks there for the government. By doing this, we've managed to eliminate a lot of that risk with, with any geotechnical um, issues. We also took on upon ourselves before we started the design is we went along the pier here and we took a number of borings because before we uh, did that geotechnical investigation, there was only two bore logs and a geophysical study that Stantec had done and we had taken bore logs, uh, Boreholes, so that would have been the crane barge you saw in July, August last year, to be able to understand exactly, exactly what's in the ground. Hence, the decision of the project team when we got here to move this to to go from a steel structure to a caisson structure, and why we as as a contractor, instead of in our contract it allows for us to be paid for rock dredging, and we could have quite happily the next few months sit here and do rock dredging and get paid for it but for the value engineering we say, the best decision for this project is don't make us go and do rock dredging because that will cost a lot more money. You know, we can shift this pier out, obviously there's more quantities there with, with soil and rock, but that will cost you less than the rock dredging and it will also give you a benefit of a buffer zone to, towards, the, uh, towards the, the bluff. So if rocks do come down, it's not coming down on the port. So I think I've uh, answered your first question with the design build and the risk. Um, the second question, I think we talked about crust overrun. So the, the, in the contract, it's very specific where the risks lie. So as an EPC lump sum contractor, we deal with the majority of the risks here. That's, that's why it's called an EPC lump sum. There are certain risks within the contract that the government take because there's certain things we as Meridian, if we had to allow for them, the price would go up and, and it would increase more. So certain risks, but very limited risks that the government take. And, and they deal with that. 
The, the third question, I believe you're referring to the Plymouth, sorry, referring to the Plymouth jetty with Interbaton. Yeah. yeah. So I used to work for Interbaton. I, I came up through the ranks with, with them. The difference between the setup we have here and the setup they had is they very much to Holland base, or they were. Unfortunately, they, they uh, terminated that uh, section of the company a year ago, two years ago. They are a Dutch based company. So when we started projects, you'd start projects in Holland. The designers were in Holland everything would be constructed or set up somewhere and then all came to site. For ourselves as Meridian, we're not a big company like they were, so we've decided to come to site, set up the office, you know, start doing the design work, start doing the, the workman statements, procurement, etc., and do that on island, which would have been a main difference between us and, and Interpaton. The, the last one, if I can, just to answer your question about the, the procurement strategy, you'll start to see exactly what you described in the coming months. So in Piper's Pond, and unfortunately I don't think I have a, a drawing here of Piper's Pond, but you know, for those that are not aware, you've got Potato Hill, Piper's Pond. We've set up our yard there. We've set up our concrete ba batch plant foundations. That's uh, coming shortly. We've set up our workshops. Today we actually poured our first slab, which would be, we're gonna pour 14 of them, and we'll start building those caissons on island in Piper's Pond. So then we'll have the steel benders, we'll have the concreters, we'll have the form workers, we'll have everyone built there. So that's another positive of what we did from changing the design from steel to concrete, is we can fabricate it all here in Montserrat. It, it helps the environment, helps the labour supply, the procurement supply. Any more? Since I heard that you're going to change the design, I went online at the factory where the design and build the same type of locks that you propose. Mm -hmm. And I saw the uh, making of the blocks from beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. Very good um, blocks, very strong blocks, but the time factor and what they tell you because of the time factor and the strength of the, the blocks, I'm saying to you that since you're going to produce the blocks here, it would have been so nice because these they're putting after one day, uh, casting the blocks, they're putting it in a heat chamber for a number of days. So as the PSI in the blocks would bring us up to the required standard. So why can't you get your block to do something that we, the, the people, can see that something is going on? Put together your, 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 your people to build it, or if you're going to in, um, import the steel thing that they're making, the blocks, something of that nature. I, I, and, it should be, be, be going on because it's going to take some time before you can drop those blocks into the sea. Mm -hmm. I have no problem with that. I'm not making any problems. Yep. But I'm just saying that the procurement system here needs some beefing up mm -hmm. so that we, the people, you know, we pass every day, you look, we go, and we are very fast, people, to see what's going on. And um, it would have been so nice to see you start to mold your, your, your blocks for the project and that sort of thing. So thank you very much. That's just uh, the few things that kind of on my mind. Uh, uh, appreciate it. In the coming months, I can promise you, when you go past Piper's Pond, you'll start to see that. If you go past there now, you'll start to see the base slabs that we poured. We poured the first one today, and we'll continue to pour them in it. Thank you. Um, you spoke about two phases, the first phase and the second phase. And you spoke ab also about um, ships docking on the windward side, yeah, of, yeah, side the, yeah. of the jetty. Um, I assume that right now with the first phase, phase, first phase you can, you can According to the diagram, you can dock, but according to the photo, um, 
rendering there. Um, you, is it going to be rendered in a way that you can get access from that windward side when you dock onto the jetty? No, what, what once it becomes phase two, mm -hmm. th this, this side here will be closed off. You'll no longer be able to use that for a berth or anything. Okay. What, what's okay. missing from this, this uh, image here is a, is a wall or th this rock going up higher, so you wouldn't actually be able to see those trucks. So in the first phase, you'll have people allowed to dock on both sides. Correct. But in the second phase, there will be no docking on the windward side. Correct. Okay. But right. what, what, what you'll get is, just to explain, and I'm answering for Stan Tech and the government here, but to answer the question is, this was more because of the funding available, that this couldn't be taken all the way. And because it was open, the decision was, was made to t tell us, put some fenders there, put some bollards, let's use it while we can use it. Obviously, we understand the weather won't always be favourable, so you'll be able to use the inside a lot more than you'll be able to use the outside. Once you go to phase two, you have greater protection on the outside, so you'll be able to use the inside a, a lot more. So that, that'll be the trade-off, that you'll have a secure, sheltered in, in, a, in a berth that won't be exposed to as much weather as it will currently be in phase one. Okay, thank you. And final question. Are you intending to use some of the, what they call, stay bits that are in Plymouth? Uh, n not at the moment. We're, we're currently looking at a way that we can do this by using more local material. Because if once we go to the concrete, based on what we've tested so far and based on what's in the contract, the requirements, is uh, the concrete would come from, from overseas. As if we can do this using local rock that will be suitable, that we're testing at the moment, then we are trying to make that all out of rock so that, that can then be continued with rock as well. Okay, and finally, Wearing my hat as executive director of the Montserrat National Trust, we have an issue with Bransbury Point in terms of the erosion on the northern side of that. Um, it's a heritage facility. Um, we just want to know if there's any scope in your outreach relationship, um, your relationship with the community to assist in your, when you're passing by Bransby Point, to drop off a few boulders to um, we, ensure. We, we, we can have a look. The government did a very good job of squeezing us down on the price. So, so there's um, not much left. We'd like to talk to you guys. But we, we, we can have a look and I'm, I'm sure if I uh, took all the requests from along the coast here, we could be busy for another two, three years. But, but, but this is an NGO. We're not yeah, doing it for profit. But we, we definitely have a look. We, we do intend to do some... Uh, some community. Do, with the community. Okay. We're trying to get away from where there is funding to help the people that don't have the funding are not in the spotlight. Thank so you very much. Appreciate that. Them. We have some questions online. So I, I know there, there are some further questions online. Um, so it's a, one of the questions is around, um, are there any provisions being made for future expansion of the pair? Actually, say so why no provision is being made to extend the pair to at least twice its length in the, in the future. Now, uh, one of the, the de design criteria for this pair um, is for it to be expandable, or for it to be model, modular, in that in, in the future we can expand on, on the length, at least, and also we have been speaking towards the addition of, of the, the breakwater and the wave wall, which would provide additional protection of the harbor. One of the key things that we, we are trying to, to create here is, is to get the harbor as calm as possible, even in extenuating situation. I think the design wave height is about seven, seven meters, seven meters, and so that is almost, almost 20 feet wave, wave height. It's quite significant, but the intent is once we would have reached phase two, is that we, we would be able to to create some calmness inside of the harbor, especially protecting the existing jetty as well. Uh, I think the next question was around funding for phase two. At the moment, we do not have funding for phase two. Um, the question is asked, what is the funding for the project? 
and how it is broken down over the two phases. So there's no funding currently for, for the second phase. Um, there's an estimated cost and uh, for phase two, the project in its entirety, which would have included the phase two, was more than twice the amount that is being costed for now. And hence, the government had to go back to Stantec and say to them, look, this is the pocket of money that we have. What can we get in, in, in the situation? In the meantime, while we, we look to get additional funding. Uh, so that was an option that was taken, and which took us down to iteration K, iteration K. Uh, pre the one prior to that was this, was this design. And so the current design would have all these breakwaters strip away, but the structure itself will be able to act as a deflector of the wave action up to a certain condition. Uh, I think, yes, that is the questions in terms of when phase two would go ahead. In my capaci current capacity, I do not have the answer for that. Thank you. Um, phase two sounds to me like when foul get teeth. Because I recall from the previous meeting, when the question was asked, it was said that to put the additional breakwater would cost $70 million. Am I correct? You just said that it would be double the cost if you were to do both. But I remember a figure saying yes. 70 so million. I, yeah, I do not re re recall that, that figure, but from, from the information I saw, um, this, this design in its entirety was about 100, over 180 something million dollars. So you're saying it's, it's, it's that, about double. that to add the breakwater you're speaking about in phase two, would cost the same amount as building the pier. Yes, along with some um, Good. Ex extension. So when fall get teeth. Good. Correct. We establish that. <laughs> right. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to highlight, because you're glossing over it, and I remember things. So I'm bringing out for somebody who asked me a question here earlier. He asked me about the wall. Just Patterson, if you could stand there, or one of you could go there and show us. And somebody alluded to it just now that when you're finished, we wouldn't be able to see the trucks on the pier because there will be an 18-foot wall on top of the pier. That was my understanding from the previous meeting and from hearing you on the radio last Tuesday. Thursday. Thursday morning on the radio. This is a drawing of the phase two condition. It does show the deck at three meters and it shows a five meter wall, so 15, 16 feet, yes. So in, in this view here, you would not see the trucks because they would be higher than the trucks. This rendering does not show the wall. From the seaside. From the, from the seaside. seaside. So conversely, when you're sitting at Moses, you won't, you won't see the, 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 the horizon. That's what I'm thinking. So I, I want those visuals to prove that yes or no. And, and, and as geologists and physicists, those numbers, you used to teach me geography or was it Franklin, Mr. Greenaway? Physics you taught me, physics, and, and, right. and Mr. Greenway taught me geography, and I remember distinctly sitting in the class, and he would say, if you're on a mountain this high, and you're looking at something that far, far in the distance, what can you see or not see? So we need to have those, that piece of information. Yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I am not saying anything, I am not saying anything to, 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 to say I'm in opposition to what is happening. Just, I am merely yeah. trying to bring out what it will be. It's a valid question. What's the visual impact of the project? Exactly. So it's a valid question. So I'm not saying that it shouldn't happen or it should happen. Right. That is not my objective at all. I have no objection to the port, please. I understand. But I want us to understand what we're getting because it is what it is. We are getting up here with a 15-foot wall on the windward side. That is what my understanding is. Correct. So therefore, the, the aesthetics of the area will change to some degree. We just need to know that. They will indeed. And Mr. Rawson has alluded to the fact that he's looking at uh, renderings, uh, uh, more visual, visual tools so that we can better understand those questions. 
Um, I, j I just, one, one, one other thing. I was asked again online here um, to, read, to ask the question again. What are the plans for the fishermen? Because they still have not gotten an answer. And the uh, corollary to that was also, what about the, um, the yachts, mooring for the yachts? What, where is that in the whole, the grand scheme of things? We had a focus group with the fishers. Yeah, last he's one of those persons who were in the group, and he's asking still what it is. Okay. Nelson, you want to take that? So in, in terms of, of mooring for the yachts and even for, for, for fisher folks who choose to do so, if we look at the vigil here, uh, currently they, they, they are mooring just on the outside here. And once, once we would have completed the project in its entirety, the area would still be available for yachting and, and for fisher folks. But the fishermen themselves have expressed that there is a need for a landing facility for them. And so um, one of the things that we are looking at is whether there is a possibility for even um, Meridian with their construction of the casing is for, for, the, for, for a landing site to be built for them within the Little Bay area. That is currently being looked at. That was a question that was raised at the last focus group meeting. And I did give my commitment that I would raise that question and pursue that option. I have already raised it with, with, with Stantec as well. I haven't raised it with, with, the, with the contract. Obviously, it, it has um, financial implication as well. But it, it needs much discussion. And I'm hopeful that we can find a solution before um, we even complete this, this, this project. If you go back to the, the, the main page of the presentation, the front page, the very front page. No, the front page, right, that, that one I think it is. If you look in front of Piper's Pond, there's a little sketch for a little jetty there. Is it the case that that is no longer in the plans? Mm -hmm. Yes, we did, we did, we did say that. Um, you didn't say that tonight? Yes. No, that not, well, I'm not sure if you said that. Okay. So, so, so it is no longer in, in the plans because I recall that that was tentatively a, a kind of a gift that they were proposing that they would leave for the said fishermen who are asking yes. about accommodation. Correct, correct. And, and the fisherman asked me what will happen in the interim because as far as they, they're understanding the, 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 the moorings, not the moorings, the trailers for their vessels will not arrive before the end of the year. And if you're planning to remove, move them from the area by next month when the dredging ship comes in, what will happen to them in the interim? Okay, so um, in terms of the trailers arriving, I don't know about before the end of the year, but I can tell you we are steadily working on purchasing those trailers. There's a possibility they might, they might not arrive by the time the judge, judging equipment arrive. However, we are looking at, at other options as to where we can mow them temporarily. But I know at some point the fishing trailers would, would arrive and fishing folks would have those available to remove their vessels at, at their ledger. Uh, and of course, the temporary jetty um, is no longer being pursued within the Piper Spun. Um, earlier, Peter mentioned that they, they, are, they have now constructed a a, a rock jetty just alongside the existing, if I could find. Yes, so that white structure that you're seeing alongside the existing, existing pair on the north, north side of the existing jetty, that is what is, they're hoping that their, their 5,000 ton badge would, would come in and a lot of their heavy materials, rather than using our already fragile road infrastructure. Um, most of the material will come, come on their badges via that and, and heavy equipment as well. Just, just for clarification, uh, on the, on the, with that same landing area that they, they're making there, one would have thought, just a, as a layman, that after everything is finished, you could leave some sort of structure like that in place for the said fishermen. Correct. And it would be sheltered. However, mm. my further understanding is that it would not be practical because it would be within the port area. Right. Correct. So although it is, would be ideal for, for, for the ships to be stationed, it is not a place where you would want ships to be. Permanently. Because it is a, an active port area which has security issues. 
So that has to be made clear to everybody. Yes. So, that, so um, that, that was discussed at length during our focus group with the fisher folks, and you're quite right. And the fishermen them, themselves, they're not comfortable in, in using a facility within the port area, given um, their experience. Uh, but one of the quick wins which we hope to look at in, in the interim as well is there's a rural ramp. Is a rural ramp? Yes. There's, there's a ramp that they're currently using to take up the, a slipway. Yes, slipway. And so what they have requested is, is that if we can remove some of, some of the boulders across there, it would make their, their landing much safe, safer. So, I mean, even those quick wins that we, we are looking at as, as to whether there are possibilities in that. And again, I want to re reiterate um, community progress is our purpose and it's our endeavor that we can engage the community and come up with you know, solutions as much as as we can. I must say, we won't be able to solve all, all our problems, but one of the best way of, of, of going forward is to engage our community and have our community involved, is to have a lot of local knowledge involved in what we are doing. Thank you. Yes, okay. Go ahead, I'll ask good, you good evening, yeah. Um, the last time, Mr. Patterson, the last time we saw each other, you talked about the, the angle of the jetty having been modified or it was in consideration. Has that been confirmed? Um, and can you tell us by how much and what difference it will make? Because you did also say that, which makes sense. When you, you change it, other things would have to change alongside with it. Can you explain that a little bit more for me, please? All right, so in, in the view, um, the red lines represent the where the ex existing structure would be, mm -hmm. and the white part is the end of the existing, existing pair. Mm -hmm. um, I know from, from, from um, when they were putting together the design concept, which is fine, uh, yeah. Uh, that was actually opened up by um, 24, 24 degrees. I think it's stated on some of some of the plans mm -hmm. as to that angle, and it's it's a balance in itself. In, in itself, because while you open up the pair 24 degrees, it allows for more wave action to come inside of the harbor. Yeah. But at the same time, it agitates agitates the harbor and, and reduce some of the likelihood of, of of that being having still water. And you know when the water is very still, come with the stench and all that. So you allow for some in, inflow and outflow flushing of the, of the harbor itself. As to how, that extent, as to what, uh, how it would happen, um, it is not known as Rob mentioned earlier, uh -huh. but I think that is a plus for the project. Yes, and it also improves navi navigation, opening up that, uh -huh. that degree allows the ships to even berth in a, in a more um, safe, in a safe manner. So the issue of the dredging and the cleaning is still, um, is still an issue? It's, it's, it's still a factor. Uh -huh. And in any port facility, I can guarantee you, dredging is required. Um, even, and, it, and it's not, it's not an equal situation because um, Port Plymouth, even that we had to judge, mm -hmm. but we know bulk of that material is because of Volcanic, yeah. mater volcanic material, but posts right around the world as part of their maintenance plan, judging, judging is required. Once there is sun, um, the, the wave action is gonna bring that in at some point and it may not um, go back out as, as, as often yeah. as we would want it to be. We, I do take notice of, of the, the, the beaches in Montserrat. Certain time of the year, they're filled with sand, so much so that I've seen times where they, they actually remove and, and used for different purposes. Yeah. Um, other times there's just stone on the beach with the wave action that has taken place. Yeah. But it's nature. Yeah, the judging is not so much my issue, I get that. Mm -hmm. My concern is the garbage, the dead dogs and styrofoam cups and so on that are still gonna come in there. Okay. Um, and you, you talked about stench, I'm, I'm glad you said that. Because you have stench, then you don't have Little Bay. You don't have what we have a Little Bay. And so that is my issue. Um, if we are getting a pier, which is inadequate, there's no, no plan being made to 
adjust the port area even to accommodate what will come in on this pier. And we're destroying the social and therefore the economic factors in Little Bay. What's the plan? Oh, all right. So um, I guess you missed my early presentation. Mm -hmm. I, I was the first. I listened to some of it. I listened to some of it. I was, I was man, moving we, around. We, but we spoke to um, what we're actually doing mm -hmm. in terms of preserving the social mm -hmm. fabric of, of um, the harbor mm -hmm. of Little Bay. Um, you speak to about economic activities um, with the removal of the, the corals um, and relocating them elsewhere, actually, in two locations. Uh, by the way, no, no, not to interrupt you, but have you, are they all going to be removed then, all of them, or just still some? As much as possible. Uh, we, we, um, what does that mean, as much as possible? So 10 percent? Currently, there's, um, in terms of percentage, I, I can't tell you, but there's about 200, over 200 pieces on the list, Rob. So, so far we would, would have taken out about 80 pieces out of the 280, mm -hmm. and those 80 pieces is within the, the budget that is available. Um, we are hoping through other interventions that we'll move um, a lot more of that as well, so as to preserve, preserve those pieces and ens ensure that is, is regrowth. Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, those 80 are on the prioritized list based on the IUCN red list. I could never remember exactly. Um, but it's an, in, it's an international committee which, which, which looks at, at um, protecting the, those species that are, you know, that, that, that are endangered. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that is taken into consideration. So um, my, my one other question, um, I'm not quite sure who has the answer for this, because I asked the head of the PMO, and I haven't got a response yet. The economic impact of this new pier um, compared to the estimated, expected, projected, desired economic impact of this pier compared to what's happening now, has that been estimated in, the, in I, this project I, I do, planning? I, as I stand here, I don't, do not have that answer, but yeah. we can look into that. But um, usually, before any project is done, a business case is developed, and an economic analysis and cost-benefit analysis is derived. So likely there's, there's that information available. So we, we can look into that and have it available. Well, can you do that, please? I really would like to see that, because I think it would help clear up some issues, because the, apart from what will and will not come through the port, on, along the pier itself, the economic impact to the businesses that are there and the businesses that could develop that will not develop if Little Bay is stink and dirty has to be a, a major consideration in this. And we're not, hearing, we're not hearing much of that. We're hearing figures and numbers and lengths and caseums and meters and so on. But the really important point, we're not hearing them. And I, I, I get that much of it has to do with the, um, the people who are responsible for this before it got to the, the the contractors, um, but it has to be, if we're gonna continue having these meetings and we're not talking about that, then we're wasting time, in my opinion. We need to have it, because we need to understand, um, we need a port, oh, sorry. But unless the port is going to make a significant difference in the positive mm -hmm. to our, to mantra, to our livelihoods, then, and, in, I, and I think it's important that you show us this when we have these meetings. Okay. Thank you, I appreciate the comments and the questions. Um, I, I wanna re reiterate, um, we, we're expecting um, benefits from, from this project um, with a, a much safer, protected harbor. Definitely, um, we should see benefits and we can look into the figures and share them with you. Thank you. Ms. Sylvie, yes. Ms. Sylvia, one last question, please. Sorry. At the original launch of this project, the premier at the time referred to this project as a breakwater 
with birthing facilities. It seemed then that the priority and the importance of um, what was called um, a grand step in terms of up future economic opportunities for Mantra were dependent on a breakwater with birthing facilities. I understand the information and the cost implications that have been set, and I think it's relevant to Shirley's question. Is this going to really have the same kind of significant um, economic activity and stimulus for growth? I know that you're not, you're not economists. Um, and perhaps the question is better asked elsewhere and you can answer that. And if this is truly, this new pier is essentially a breakwater, then why is there part of a breakwater on it now? And the second stage, if I'm understanding this correctly, will include the extension of that little piece of breakwater. Or am I misreading the um, the drawing there. Is my question clear? Yeah. The, what did you yeah, I, I think your question is clear. And then there's, what is the extent of the breakwater today? What is it in the future? Why did we go only a portion of the way? And, and again, the purpose of this whole pier is to provide a protected area for mooring so that it's more reliable uh, for most of the year. And that's happening right now. We, we talk about breakwater, but like I said, a little bit ago, this is a breakwater. It's a gravity structure. It's huge. It's going to attenuate or slow down the waves as they come from this direction. So this was a, a portion of this. This protects the row row ramp here. Uh, we're, we, we propose to have a, a certain portion of this breakwater happening now because we need to protect this area. We wanted also to have birthing opportunities on the seaside of this structure which is in, in cases where weather is favorable, it's great to have twice as much birthing length available. So, so there is a breakwater. This is, we, we, I think we're confused about break. Breakwater is a structure that attenuates waves, that slows down waves. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be a pile of rock or it could be a pier. But this structure will, this is, because um, it, it's, a, it, it's a degree, phase two is a degree to provide even more protection. That's the reason. So thank you very much for coming. And I'm hoping that we were able to update you. You got some of your questions answered. And you're not as confused as when you came in. Right, Mr. Yeward? OK, thank you. Should I call my friend, Ms. Osborne, to ask if anything got cleared up for her? Oh my, why did I? <laughs> the, um, if, since the, the design is not yet complete, mm -hmm. will there be some um, amendment to the environment and impact assessment? Because I'm not quite sure if I understand how the environment, the environment impact assessment that was done for a different design will adapt to a design that's not yet been completed. I, I, I can I can share. And can you tell me what percentage we are in terms of and close to the end, the, the final design? How how yeah, close are we, so, please? Um, I can speak to that. Uh, in terms of the environmental impact, in, environmental social impact assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, when we had upgraded to iteration K, um, of course, the EIA was updated as well, and that we had to go back to the I public. So yeah. uh -huh. at present, um, we had to represent that to the public. So the EIA was indeed updated. But in terms of what is going on here in, term, mm -hmm. in, in design, we give the contractor specific parameters mm -hmm. for them to, to build. But in terms of the structure itself is what they are designing, in terms of it being able to um, withstand the impact of sliding, overturn, uplift, wave action, wave height, that sort of stuff. So those are what have been put 
into the actual design. But in terms of general position, general dimension, dimensions, those have already been um, set in the basis of, base, basis of design. Um, second part of your question? The second part is how close are you to a final design? But before, but, yeah, go ahead. So yes. we would have received the 30%, 30% design, um, which is going through the physical planning process at the moment. Um, we're expecting to have 60%. Yes, pro pro by the end of the month, I mean, based, based on the timelines that were, were given, it would have been six to 10 weeks between the 30% and, and the 60%. And then we would then move up to the 90 percent. Um, what 90 percent essentially would be looking at the main, the detail, detail, detail mm -hmm. aspects, the connection, the joints, and so, and so on. But we would have already looked at material specifications, the major structure, um, the major forces that are impacting the structure. And, and um, Rob keep mentioning this is a gravity structure. It's a massive, dense structure. That's exactly and my concern. So at the same time, the forces of nature, we know how, how powerful the forces of nature are. And so we have to design to withstand those yeah. forces. Yeah, and I, I, I get that. My, my, but I'm, I'm thinking, I, I understand environmental, strictly environmental impact assessment to look at the environs of the structure. So if you move the structure 24 degrees in one direction, then it affects all kinds of other things. So, so let me just clarify mm -hmm. that 24 degrees was decided upon even before it was given to the contractor. So, okay, that, is not, so that, that, that is not now. Okay. That, is, that, that, that happened a while, a, while, a while back. So the, the environment, the EIA would have taken that into consideration. As well, the EIA has a, a footprint for the project uh -huh. which is taken into consideration, not just the immediate, immediate area, but there's a footprint which is considered including the judge, judge area. And the judge area goes as far as just of Piper's Pond as well, within, within that um, marine traffic area. But so then I'm confused, Mr. Patterson, because I, my understanding was that 24 degrees was considered after the considerations, the questions about collection of no, garbage. No, so no. then no, so no, no, no. no um, that collection of garbage was already considered during that time. So it's, it's not a question, a question now, uh -huh. but that was considered prior. So um, nothing's changed? No. Okay. No. Okay. Public? Yes, the EIA is available to the public. It's, it's online on, it's on online. government. And it's okay. also, you can find a copy at the public library. Can the trust well. get a copy, please? Sure. Thank you. We probably can have a copy placed at the National Trust. That would be ideal. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. And Town halls will be coming at you the 1st of June. Before I leave, I want to thank you all for coming. Thanks for participating. I am a teacher who likes to see faces. But because we are online, it seems as if a lot more people joined us online than joined us face to face. Thanks anyway for being here with us. And I'm hoping that we were able to shed some light and to get some buy-in into this project. So I want to thank our partners for joining with us, Stantec, Meridian, the Monset National Trust, the Government Information Unit, the Ministry of Communications, Works, Labor, and the Environment, especially the ICT Unit, the Project Management Office, 664 Connect, Discover Monster, Monster Reporter, Aliagana Express, Live Islands, and how can I forget my teacher, Teacher Sarita, for the prayer, and drives, and Mr. Peter White, his bus was supposed to be on the road, but I see very few people, thank you. And I'm also seeing some of our engineers, our lead engineer behind there. Good night, Jamil. <laughs> and I see another. I said GIU, didn't I? But Live Islands had helped us. They had helped us to do something before, so I'm thanking them too. But I did say GIU, didn't I? You want me to single out Mr. Mead and Mr. Rondell Mead? Oh my. Thank you very much and drive safely and hopefully we'll see you in June. We haven't decided on a venue as yet, but June 1st.
All right? Thank you very much.